for the first time I've taught in this class for, I don't know, 10 years, somebody actually set the clock right. That's the first time that clock has actually been right, which is really odd. It's throwing me off. I don't know what to do. Okay. Um, oh, I did post a um, grade distribution. Uh, if you haven't seen it, there it is. And if you have questions, of course, come see me. What's that? That's the sum of the scores of the first two exams. So add your two scores together, and you can see exactly where you stand. At least I see a few people smiling. Oh. I'm sorry? Oh, you lost a wallet? Yes. Okay. It's blue, it's kind of blue-green. Where did you sit? There? Okay, anybody see a wallet? Blue-green wallet? I get 20%, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you you might check uh, uh, upstairs in the uh, exercise sports science area. They, 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 I think they've got the lost and found on the second floor. Excellent. Okay, yeah. good Thank luck. You. Okay. So, uh, there's where we are. Um, and getting back to transcription. So, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, so, I want to get uh, in and, and get going with this. I hear a lot of chatter. Is there something I'm missing? Maybe not. OK. Um, all right, so I talked last time about uh, promoters and what promoters were. And promoters are, um, of course, recognition binding sites for proteins that affect transcription. That's what a promoter is. Uh, promoters, as we will see, um, are ahead of genes. Or you have seen they are ahead of genes. We'll see it more with. Uh, eukaryotic uh, promoters uh, later, uh, but they are ob obviously critical for telling the RNA polymerase where to start. That's a very important function that they perform. Once an RNA uh, polymerase has gotten started, it makes a structure that looks a little bit like this. And uh, this is a, a schematic representation of what's happening during transcription, and it illustrates something that we call uh, a, a transcription bubble. And the bubble is this unlooped strand, okay? Because remember, we're only copying one strand. We have this strand that loops out, and it forms a sort of a bubble. And inside this bubble, we have the RNA polymerase that is copying the strand and adding uh, the uh, nucleoside triphosphates um, uh, in the form of nucleoside, di uh, nucleoside monophosphates as it, it, it moves further along. The polymerase, in this case, is moving from uh, right to left. It is making RNA in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, which means it's copying the other strand, which is reading in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction. You'll also notice that the um, uh, RNA uh, that's being made hangs off. There's a tail that hangs off. So it doesn't, there's only a small portion of it that actually remains double, um, uh, in the double helical form with the DNA. So as this guy progresses forwards, more and more of the tail hangs off. And that tail hanging off turns out to be uh, a pretty critical thing uh, for bacterial cells because in bacterial cells, uh, the ribosome will come along and actually start translating this guy as uh, uh, the uh, transcription itself is, is progressing. So transcription and translation in bacteria can occur uh, at pretty close to the same location and pretty close to the same time. Um, needless to say, we have to unwind the um, uh, DNA duplex as they're moving along, or the, uh, our cells do this as well as bacterial cells. And though we don't use helicase at 6,000 RPM, there are some proteins that help to facilitate the unwinding. And not, no surprise, if we're unwinding things, we also have to have a topoisomerase ahead of the, the system to keep the uh, superhelical tension from getting too high, forming knots and things like that. One of the things that we have to do with RNA that we didn't have to do with DNA is we have to rewind the thing after the bubble uh, has formed here. And so it turns out that there are topoisomerases that are needed both behind and ahead of the replication bubble. All right? So uh, I won't go into detail about those, but, that, but suffice to say that both of those are needed. OK. Um, I want to say a little bit, uh, OK, so if we think about the, the process of, of transcription, uh, we'll say the same thing about translation. It occurs in three, form, in, in three steps, a step called initiation, a step called elongation, and a step called termination. 
All right. So the um, initiation uh, happens uh, in, in the promoter uh, where the proteins bind and the RNA uh, is opened up. The phase of initiation actually occurs, um, it, it actually includes about the first incorporation of the first 10 or so nucleotides. And it's at about that point that the sigma factor goes away and that the RNA polymerase then continues along uh, on its merry journey. Elongation, uh, no surprise, just occurs as the RNA polymerase continues moving along. There's really not much that's noteworthy about elongation, although I did mention that the RNA polymerase goes in what I call fits and starts, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, kind of like this, as it's making its way through the DNA. Eventually, the RNA polymerase reaches a point where it needs to stop making RNA, and it's at that point we enter what's called the termination phase. Okay? Now, the termination phase in bacteria has uh, two general mechanisms that cells use. If you think about it, having a termination is important because uh, cells don't copy the entire genome and make RNA. That would be wasteful. And they don't want to make all of the RNAs all the time anyway, which is what they would make if they copied the entire genome. So they want to stop the transcription at... Um, I won't say a specific point, although in some cases it is a specific point. In many cases, it's more of a general area where these occur. So the mechanism I'm going to show you here is one that's fairly specific where termination will happen. Okay? It's fairly specific where termination will happen. This mechanism I'm going to show you um, is called factor-independent termination, meaning it doesn't use a factor, a protein factor, to terminate transcription. Now, I'm going to show you this, this or actually I am showing you this uh, structure on the screen that I'm going to back up and show you uh, that transcription bubble again and kind of give you an idea about what's going on where. All right, well, if you look at this, what you see on the screen is an RNA, because you can see the U's in there, all right, an RNA that the RNA polymerase was synthesizing. It was copying a sequence in the DNA. And you'll notice that this sequence that it copied had something that could make base pairs with itself. Okay? So this was a sequence that was built into the DNA. It would have been located at the end of a gene. It would have been located at the end of a gene. So the RNA polymerase copied it, and as soon as it finished copying here, this guy sees this guy, sees this guy, sees this guy, sees this guy. They're very close to it, relatively close to each other. And sproing, they form this structure that you can see on the screen. Okay? We call this structure a hairpin. There are many different ways in which hairpins, or many different hairpins that actually form. This hairpin performs a very important function in the process of termination. So I want you to see the structure and keep this idea uh, in mind. Now, if we go back to the transcription bubble and look at that, this transcription bubble, the RNA polymerase would have been moving along and it would have copied that sequence and that sequence would have started appearing out here. It would have started appearing out here. And when it appeared, it would form that little structure that I just described to you. Now, what that little structure does is it, it actually gives a lift to the RNA polymerase. We can see the RNA polymerase is in tight, and this, this RNA polymerase is exaggerated, by the way. It's not that big compared to the DNA and, and RNA. But this RNA polymerase would be sitting on this strand of DNA, copying it as it goes along. And that little structure that I showed to you goes sproing, and it lifts it up. So just like the jack on your car you would use to lift to get the wheel up, so too does this structure form, and it lifts the RNA polymerase up. And what it's doing is lifting the butt end of the RNA polymerase off of the DNA. By doing so, it actually favors the release of the RNA polymerase from the DNA. It's favoring the release of the RNA polymerase from the DNA. Well, when the RNA polymerase falls off of the DNA, transcription stops. And it's happening very, very close to where this structure forms. All right? Now if we go back and we look at that sequence again, here's the sequence, and we see that right after that sequence, 
Looky there. There is a sequence of u, 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 u. U pairs with A and forms a relatively weak set of hydrogen bonds. Two hydrogen bonds per base pair instead of three. That lifting up of the RNA polymerase also favors the lifting up of the RNA because this isn't very tightly held to the DNA. So this lifting up accomplishes two purposes. One is that the RNA polymerase is released from the DNA, and two, the RNA itself is released from the DNA. At that point, everything's done. So we've used no protein factors. That's why we call it factor-independent trans uh, a, a transcriptional termination. Right? And I want to show you factor-dependent, but before I do that, I'll ask if you have any questions about what I've just shown you here. Yes, sir? Could you repeat your question? So the, the hairpin structure has formed in the RNA. What you're seeing is the RNA. And it has lifted the polymerase off of the DNA and destabilized the RNA so that it falls off as well. Yes? I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you please, okay, please repeat about the, how this, this, uh, this poly U tail is, has to do okay. with it? Okay, so his question is how does the poly U tail relate into the release of RNA from the DNA? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we see that RNA here is paired to RNA. Yes. It's a good question. If RNA is paired to RNA, there's no RNA paired to DNA. Mm -hmm. The only RNA paired to DNA is right here. So, but RNA pairs to <coughs> and this is a weak set of base pairing that's happening, and this falls off. Okay? Yes? I don't understand the actual mechanism by which the hairpin actually separates the RNA from the DNA. Okay, doesn't understand the, the mechanism by which RNA polymerase separates the RNA from the DNA? Okay. Well, it's. The hairpin separates the RNA. I'm sorry, I said it the wrong way. How the, how the RNA, the hairpin in the RNA separates the RNA polymerase from the DNA. Okay. It's actually a physical lifting that's, that's going on. All right? So if we look here, all right, imagine this RNA polymerase is about a quarter the size as you see it up there, so that it's sort of in this area right here. Its butt end is sitting right there on the, uh, on the DNA. Uh, let's see, there's the RNA. So it's sitting right there on the DNA right there. If this hairpin structure forms, it just lifts the butt end up. Right? So imagine that you took a jack and you jacked up your car, but you forgot to block the wheels. Right? And you left it in neutral. What's going to happen to the car? It's going to go rolling, right? Well, this RNA polymerase is going rolling. That's what's happening with it. So it's, it, it's not in the, in the proper configuration for it to go on making uh, uh, RNA in transcription, and so the RNA polymerase is released. OK? <coughs> Excuse me, yes? <coughs> So uh, the top isomerase is, is required up here because we have too much tension. We're relieving the tension. Back here, the top isomerase is needed because we have too little tension. So uh, it, it works both ways. And remember I said top isomerase can put in or take out twists as necessary. And that's what it's doing here. Yes? What if, for example, another, uh, so again, now I see in this picture how RNA is like still bound to the DNA strand. Yes. However, what on, of, if on another end, uh, after this, uh, Phosphate tail. There will be uh, not you, but some other polytail that will be creating like three hydrogen bonds with DNA strand. I mean, how how can we ensure that it's that RNA bound to DNA will always be bound with weak bonds? Oh, DNA? his question. Okay, so his question is, how do how do we know that we're always going to have U's there? Well, what's built into the DNA sequence? is not only this sequence, but this sequence as well. So this whole thing is functioning as a termination signal. This is physically lifting it up. This is allowing the rapid release. This is coded in the DNA. OK, but what about another part? How come that, for example, the, the another tail will be still bound, and you will have not hairpin, but some other entangling structure that won't be able to unbound? Because, for example, here we have C, 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 that we may 
Well, okay. So his, I think you're asking why does it come off of the of the DNA? Is that right? Okay. So that's a more complicated question, but the answer is that it, there's only a short stretch that's stable, and it actually has to do with the hel helical winding that's happening behind there. That helps facilitate the unwinding of this. That's that's a bigger question, though. Okay. Yes. So I said there's a helicase-like protein that's unwinding the DNA. It's not the same helicase that's involved in DNA replication, no. Okay? But there is a protein that has a helicase-like function that is facilitating the unwinding of the DNA. Of the DNA. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> I've just described to you factor-independent termination. Uh, Given that one is called factor independent, it wouldn't be too surprising to think that there might be another one called factor dependent, and there is. And the factor dependent one is kind of cool. Factor dependent termination involves a specific protein called Rho, R-H-O. And Rho looks like this guy right here. It looks like, kind of like the beta clamp, except for it's got several subunits. By the way, that's the Greek letter Rho. It looks like P, but it's actually the letter Rho, all right? What this protein does is pretty cool. All right? Now, this protein results in termination that's not precise. It won't always stop at the same place, but it will generally stop at about the same general place during tran in, in transcription. How does it work? All right? Well, this one relies on that tail hanging off of the end. That tail hanging off of the end is a target for rho protein. And rho protein is really good at grabbing a hold of that tail. Okay? Rho protein likes to climb that tail. So the example I like to give is gym class where you are climbing the rope to the top of the gym. Did you guys ever have to do that in gym class? I had to do that. I, first time I did, I was terrified. Uh, you get to the top and you look down and it's like, oh my god, right? How many people had to do that? You have to do that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. All right. So, you climb that rope. Imagine if you're climbing that rope and somebody is letting it out as you are climbing it. Right? Yes, question. That's RNA. That's correct. Yeah. So this green strand is the RNA. So somebody is letting the rope out as you're climbing it. And the only way you get to the top is if you climb faster than they let the rope out, right? Well, that's what's happening here. The RNA polymerase is letting rope out, and the rho protein is you climbing that rope. When the rho protein goes faster than the RNA polymerase, then it will advance. And unless it's going faster, it won't advance. So it's a race between how fast the polymerase is working and how fast the rho protein is working. All right? Now. When the rho protein catches the RNA polymerase, it does the same basic thing that that hairpin did. It lifts the butt end of the RNA polymerase up, the RNA polymerase falls off, and the RNA also falls off, and everybody's happy. Okay? Yes? Yes. So once it catches the, catches the RNA polymerase, it physically pushes it off. Okay? Okay, so his question is, how does it know where to bind? And there are some uh, RNAs that will have sequence that will recognize and it will climb. But when, when does it start to climb? Because maybe RNA polymerase is not done yet. It's, it's not a simple answer, again. Okay. So it's, when will it start to climb? Okay, so, you're, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question, but, it, but it's one that I don't have a simple answer for, okay? I don't have a simple answer for it. But the, pr the, the principle of climbing is important. How does it catch it? Well, I said that the, the, the rho protein had to go faster than the polymerase. And the rho protein goes faster when the, the, the polymerase slows down. Now, remember how the polymerase is moving. It's going in fits and starts. It's going up here, and it's backing up. And it's going up here, and it's backing up. You're seeing some chances for the rho protein to catch it? It is getting chances. And the places where it's going to slow down typically are GC-rich sequences because it takes more to pull those guys apart and gives the RNA polymerase more of a chance to back up and slow down.
So as it's encountering those GC-rich sequences, it's going to be more likely it's going to catch the protein. Now, as I said, this doesn't give us an exact stop. But for a system that uses this mechanism, this tends to hit the same slowdown sequences, and the rope protein tends to catch the RNA polymerase in the right place, so that over a span of a few dozen nucleotides, termination will occur for these um, uh, transcripts. OK, this usually raises a bunch of questions. So there's one right here, yes. That's correct. It catches up to where it's transcribing physically on the DNA and stops it. Uh -huh. Well, the rope protein is eventually going to come off the strand because it's going to, it, it, all it knows how to do is climb. So when the RNA is released, it's going to climb and it's going to reach the end of the rope, kind of like you did, and you get up there and it's like, oh crap, right? Will the hairpin open itself back up? Not necessarily. RNAs have a lot of different structures within them, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't hurt anything. Yes, back there. What's slowing down the GC rich sequences is the RNA polymerase. And it's because it's slowing down that the rho protein gets a chance to catch it. What happens to the DNA? Well, the same thing hap it happens here as happened in the last one. The bubble will close. All right? So the, R the uh, topo isomerase back here that's rewinding the DNA will, in in will start inducing some tension in the DNA, and these duplexes will reform. Yes? Are there row proteins that can climb at different speeds? I would say in different cells, yes. I'm not aware of there being different row proteins within a given cell. No. Yes? When you say it slows down, you mean it has more fits? When I say it slows down, it has more fits. Well, more fits will certainly mean it has more, it, it won't be going as fast. That's correct. Okay. So slowing down just means, on average, its number of nucleotides per second isn't, isn't as high as, as it would have otherwise been. Okay? But, but fits will obviously contribute to that. Yes? Will the rope protein bind to RNA that has a, ha has a hairpin in it? OK. So your question is, will one mechanism versus the other win? It's a complicated story again. I'm not going to answer that. But I will tell you that RNA in general has many more hairpins in it than does DNA. So because remember, GT, GU base pairs are stable in RNA. So there's a lot more structures that happen. And RNA structure is actually quite complicated. We like to draw it and think about it as a nice straight line. But in fact, it oftentimes is not. So secondary structures like hairpins won't necessarily stop this. Yes? Is the rope protein faster than the ribosome? That's a good question. It turns out that the RNA polymerase itself is just about exactly the same speed as the ribosome. RNA polymerase, they said, was going at about 50 nucleotides uh, per second. The ribosome moves at about 15 to 17 codons per second, which is 45 to 50 nucleotides per second, OK? And the, RNA, the rho protein is going slightly faster than the RNA polymerase. So if we want to compare them, we would say it's probably slightly faster than a ribosome. Ribosomes complicate the picture because, remember, ribosomes are going to be on here as well. And that gets into a totally different kind of area. Fits and starts, yeah. Yeah, same here. It can sometimes go a little bit slower and a little bit faster. So yes. maybe it will push it earlier or lighter than push it. OK, so <laughs> it's concerned because there are different rates with which the RNA polymerase can move. The RNA polymerase does move at different rates. But for a given gene, it's going to have the same average rate. And for a given, well, I know you don't like this explanation, but it's true. All right, so for a given gene, it's, it, it works at the same average rate. And it's going to encounter the same sequences so that on average, this guy is going to, the R, row is going to catch it in the roughly the same place. That's why I say it is not a specific stop, you know, uh, termination, but it will stop it uh, in about the same average place. Okay? Yes, one last question. Uh, 
I'm not sure I understand the question. It, it, No, okay, so I'll repeat the question. So the, his, his question is that DNA is largely non-coding. That's not true, in, especially in prokaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, almost everything is coding. In eukaryotic cells, that's correct, but not in, not in prokaryotic cells. So maybe that is, does that answer your question? Why is the non-specificity of termination okay? okay? Because it works? All right. No, I'm not trying to, to, to blow it off. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that it has evolved into this, this system. You'll notice that cells don't use one mechanism. They're using more than one mechanism. So why do they have more than one mechanism? And again, I don't have an answer for it. It does work. All right? So that's why they've done that. The, the non-specificity <coughs> may work to some extent in giving transcripts that have different lengths. In prokaryotes, this may be useful because in prokaryotes, we have what are called operons, where you're going to have multiple genes on one RNA. So let's imagine that you've got a um, transcript that's being made that maybe it normally goes, let's say, for the first five or six genes before the row catches it. But every now and then, it doesn't get it caught until, let's say, gene number seven or gene number eight has been copied. If that's the case, then what that would mean was you would have a smaller number of transcripts that would have genes 1 through 8 compared to 1 through 6, but maybe you don't need genes 7 and 8 as much as you need genes 6. So it does work. All right? And that's why I say I'm not blowing that up because that uh, has some advantage for cells to have some of that variability to, have, to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Let's move on from termination and talk um, a little bit about antibiotics. Antibiotics are, uh, we will see, commonly used um, or commonly designed to affect processes in transcription and more commonly in translation. And that's because we can design antibiotics to stop specific critical processes if we design antibiotics that stop processes that are unique or to structures that are unique in uh, prokaryotic cells compared to eukaryotic cells, then we've made something that is an ideal antibiotic because we can kill bacteria and not kill human beings as a result uh, of that. Okay? Now, but all it takes to make an antibiotic is the ability to stop a process. All right? So if we stop the process of transcription, we're going to kill cells because cells have to make proteins in order to function. And they can't make proteins without making RNAs. So if we stop transcription, we stop the overall synthesis of proteins. Okay? Well, there are some antibiotics that uh, do various things. One's called rifampicin. And rifampicin has a structure you should memorize for the next exam right there. That's quick enough. All right. And what it does is it binds to the RNA uh, when it's bound to DNA during, tr during the initiation phase of transcription and doesn't allow it to proceed any farther. So it stops the movement into elongation. All right? So if, yes? The RNA and RNA polymerase. So it's a complex that's, that's actually bound, it, that the whole complex is bound. OK? Um, another one, uh, a protein that affects uh, and stops transcription is actinomycin. Actinomycin uh, works by actually intercalating, that is, inserting itself into the DNA double helix and stops the RNA polymerase from being able to move in advance through that um, uh, double helix. All right? So by stopping the movement through the double helix, it stops transcription again in the elongation phase. I saw a hand over here. Question? So the rifampicin binds to the complex of RNA, DNA, all right? and the RNA polymerase. So that whole complex, that whole open complex that we have with the bubble and everything, that's where it's binding in, in that region. Yes? Does actinomycin affect DNA duplicate replication? I believe it also affects DNA replication as well. Yes? OK. Um, now, uh, the last thing I want to say about prokaryotic transcription um, actually is in the next part. And that relates to the transcription to make tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs. So far, I've been thinking about genes 
which are, as I use the term here, genes which are coding regions for protein. These are messenger RNAs, what we've been, we've been thinking about. But cells also have to make transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs because those are needed in the process of translation. Well, in bacterial cells, you'll note that I said there was only one RNA polymerase, and that one RNA polymerase makes all of the different types of RNA. That includes the messenger RNA, the transfer RNA, and the ribosomal RNA. So one RNA polymerase makes all of those. So we need to, at least for a moment, consider how it is that the um, uh, other uh, RNAs in the cell are made. Okay? Well, it turns out that they are made in a one long transcript. Okay? They're made in, I shouldn't say one, but they're actually made in several long transcripts that are there. All right? This long transcript contains several things. It contains the six, well, one of the ribosomal RNAs called the 16S, that's also called the small ribosomal RNA. One, that's the 23S, which is the larger uh, ribosomal RNA. There's also a 5S, so 5S is actually the smallest, but it's not, it's not um, on, well, it's actually way over here at the end. All right? and the transfer RNAs, which are coded in here. Transfer RNAs are the smallest of the RNAs. They will be on the order of 70 to 100 base pairs. Yes? S refers to Spedberg units. Okay. question is, what does S refer to? And it's just a, a, another way of measuring size. So 16S is smaller than 23S. Okay. It's not proportional. All right. So it's relative sizes. So I can't say that a 23S is one and a half times the size of a 16S. Okay. Uh, but I can say that a, a 16S is smaller than a 23S. Okay? Uh, come on, don't do that. What are you doing? All right. Interference in my pocket, I think. All right. Uh, so. Anyway, these guys um, actually have to be processed out. They have to be cut out of that larger transcript before they function. And there are various nucleases that help to do that. So we've talked about nucleases doing a variety of things, cutting DNA, proofreading DNA. We also have a lot of nucleases that cut RNA. So some of these nucleases include ribonuclease P, which cuts the transfer RNAs at their five prime ends. So it sees a transfer RNA sequence, it cuts it at the five prime end, it slides down, sees another one, cuts it at the five prime end, etc. That's what ribonuclease P does. Ribonuclease 3 cuts out the ribosomal RNAs. Okay? Cuts out the ribosomal RNAs. That's the 5S, the 16S, and the 23S. And again, we're talking in bacteria here. Last, there's a modification that has, well, there are actually, there are other modifications that have to happen to the transfer RNAs. It turns out that in bacterial cells, the transfer RNAs are the most modified RNAs. We're going to see some modification going on in eukaryotic cells, but prokaryotic cells have a lot of modifications that happen primarily to the transfer RNAs. Transfer RNAs are also modified in eukaryotic cells. When I say modified, what does that mean? Well, there's two things that happen. One is at the three prime end of the transfer RNA, there's a sequence, CCA, that is added after that transcript has been made. So CCA is added to the three prime end of transfer RNAs, and that is necessary to make them be functional. So there's one modification. Other modifications include chemical modifications to the bases that are inside of the tRNA. Chemical modifications to the bases. Now, it's not completely understood why these chemical modifications happen. It may be a cell's way of targeting them to identify them as transfer RNAs. Okay? It may have some something to do in some cases with the coding information that's there. So it's not, but it's not completely clear why these modifications happen. But there are many chemical modifications that happen. I've already described one to you already, and you didn't realize it, and that was I said that if we look in transfer RNAs, we can sometimes find the base ribothymidine. Okay? Ribothymidine. 
So if we were to take a base that was U inside of uh, a transfer RNA and we put a methyl group on it in the right place, we would convert that U to a T. That would give us ribothymidine. So there's one example of a chemical modification that can happen. There are many chemical modifications that happen to ribosomal, I'm sorry, to transfer RNA bases. All right? Many modifications. There's something called pseudouracil that is formed by modifying uracil inside of transfer RNAs. Many others that I won't list here. Here are some of the modifications that can, give, that can come from uracil. So here's uh, the, the uridine base that's in the transfer RNA. There's the uh, addition of a methyl group that I described here. Here's another modification uh, to um, uh, convert this H here to a double bonded oxygen and create pseudouridine. Pseudo right? And there's many others that can happen inside of transfer RNAs. OK. Um, that's what I want to say about prokaryotic uh, transcription and prokary prokaryotic uh, transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs. I want to spend a little bit of time. Yeah. Does ribonucleus 3 cut at 5 prime and 3 prime ends? It cuts at 5 prime ends, but, the, but, but they're lined up pretty much one next to the other next to the other. So by cutting at the 5 prime end, of this one, it might be separating the three prime end from the other one there. So it's essentially doing what, what, what the cell needs. Yes? Yes, the question is, is CCA what's being added to transfer RNA? And the answer is yes, it is. It's being added to the three prime end. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Eukaryotic ribosome, uh, I'm sorry, eu eukaryotic uh, transcription. And by the way, what I'm talking about here in terms of transcription, I'm talking about in fairly general terms. In about uh, four lectures or so, I will turn to the topic of gene expression, where we're looking at transcription much more closely about what's happening, how it is that cells have really interesting controls on how much transfer RNA, uh, 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 on how much uh, messenger RNA that they're making. Okay? We've seen some of them with respect to promoters. There are other things that control how much of given genes are being transcribed. So we'll save that to when I talk about gene expression. What I want to do right now is talk about um, transcription and eukaryotes, again, in a, in eukaryotes in a, in a very general sense. This very general sense um, is uh, illustrated here, where we compare the process of transcription in a prokaryote versus a, versus a eukaryote. And they are very different. And they're very different because eukaryotes have organelles. And the processes, for example, of tra the process of translation occurs in a eukaryotic cell in the cytoplasm, but the transcription that makes the RNA is occurring in the nucleus. So we see a physical separation of transcription and translation in eukaryotic cells. And there's no physical separation in prokaryotic cells. So that means that, like I said earlier, in a prokaryotic cell, what can happen is as this tail comes off, the ribosome can start to bind it, just like the rho protein can start to bind it, and start translating it while the RNA polymerase is still doing its thing. Okay? While the RNA polymerase is still doing its thing, translation can start. Okay. That can't happen in a eukaryotic cell. Because in a eukaryotic cell, transcription is occurring inside the nucleus, but translation is occurring out here. That means that the messenger RNA is completely made inside of the nucleus before it gets out here. It actually has to be moved out into the cytoplasm. And as we shall see, there's a lot of things that happen to messenger RNAs in a eukaryotic cell in the nucleus, a lot of things. Prokaryotic cells, there's virtually no processing. Once the RNA, once the messenger RNA is there, the cell can grab it and start translating it. In a eukaryotic cell, that would be disastrous if that started to happen. It would be disastrous. Okay. Now we'll see why that's disastrous later. So physical separation of those two. As I mentioned earlier in the lecture, the rate of movement of a ribosome is just about the same as the rate of movement of the RNA polymerase copying the DNA. 
They both move at about 45 or so nucleotides per second. Okay? And if we do codons, which are three base sequences, divide that 45 by three, we get about 15 to 17 codons per second, 15 to 17 amino acids that are being made into a protein per second. That's still pretty remarkable when we think about it. OK, eukaryotic cells have multiple DNA, I'm sorry, multiple RNA polymerases. They don't have just one, all right? Now, we will talk about three, and there's that, there are actually others that have RNA polymerase activity. We will talk about three that are uh, the most important ones for the types of RNA that we've talked about here. We see them broken down by the type of RNA that they make, okay? So, for example, if we look at RNA polymerase 3, we see that it's mostly involved in making the small RNAs, transfer RNAs and the 5S ribosomal RNA. Those are the smallest ones that are there. RNA polymerase 2 is involved in making messenger RNA, so it's making the, the, the things that code for protein, and it's involved in making small nuclear RNA. And I'll say a brief word about those, not today, but probably on Friday. Small nuclear RNAs play important roles in controlling, again, how much uh, of given um, gene expression actually occurs in a cell. Last, the type 1 RNA polymerase makes the larger ribosomal RNAs. And in the eukaryotic cell, we actually have an extra ribosomal RNA. It's known as the 5.8S. So we have an 18S that corresponds to the 16. We actually have a 5, the 5 point actually corresponds to the 5S of the um, prokaryotic cells. It's the 5S down here that's the novel one. This, this corresponds to the 5S of the prokaryotic cells. And the 28S corresponds to the 23S. And no, I don't care that you worry about those numbers. The numbers aren't that important. All right? But I will talk about specific things about each number all right, later when I talk about translation. I will, will expect you to know the specific things about those things involved in translation. Okay, um, this table is showing you the, uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon, and that is the inhibition of action of these RNA polymerases by a compound known as alpha amanitin. And alpha amanitin is a deadly poison that's found in some mushrooms. When you hear about people eating mushrooms and then having to go and uh, have a liver transplant as a result of eating de deadly mushrooms, it's happening because they have inhibited their RNA polymerase 2. Notice that it's strongly inhibited by alpha amanitin. And that inhibition um, knocks out the production of messenger RNAs, which of course are necessary for protein. And as we've talked about before, you lose the ability to make protein, you're going to die. The liver is the detoxifying organ of the body. You eat something like alpha manitin, the liver is going to be the first thing that's going to get a hold of it, and the liver can't handle it. So if you eat alpha manitin, you are going to need, I'm not making this up, you are going to need a liver transplant within hours or you're going to be dead. Okay? So think about that the next time you see that really cool looking mushroom that you decide that you're going to eat. And there's more than one type of poisonous mushroom. All right? So it would be nice if you could say that's the one type of mushroom I don't have to eat, but I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to worry about. But in fact, there are, there are multiple types of poisonous mushrooms. So alpha amanitin is a very poisonous compound. OK, this is what alpha amanitin looks like. There's another structure for you to memorize for the exam. Really ugly structure. I heard somebody say, ha ha, I didn't have to say it. Okay. This is a death cap, is it? I'm not sure. I'll keep you guys thinking, right? All right. Um, let's talk about uh, one, one more thing, and then we'll have a song, maybe even two songs, if you guys are up for it, all right? Um, when we look at promoters, OK, for um, eukaryotic cells, they have a very different structure than promoters for prokaryotic cells. They're way more complex. We have what are called multiple sequence elements. When you hear the word element, I want you to think about a stretch of sequence that is specific for something. 
a stretch of sequence that's specific for something. They have multiple sequence elements. Now, we had two sequence elements that we talked about in prokaryotic cells. We talked about the minus 10 and the minus 35. Those were sequence elements. Here, we see sequence elements okay, that uh, are, in some cases, upstream. Here's a ta, -ta box. Here's a promoter. We see these different letters referring to different sequences that are bound by different proteins. And that's the other thing that's very different about eukaryotic uh, transcription. There are many proteins involved in starting transcription, identifying where the start site is. Now, this is partly because of the fact that eukaryotic genomes are enormous in size. They're, they're about 1,000 times bigger than prokaryotic genomes. They have a lot of non-coding DNA, as he referred to up here earlier. So locating the proper place for the gene is important. Okay. And, and this is probably the biggest and most important consideration, in eukaryotic cells, we have histones. These are proteins that the DNA wraps around. So there's a very complicated complex of proteins and DNA. And through that mix of stuff, the transcription factors have to, and by the way, the transcription factors are the proteins that bind and start this process. The transcription factors have to find this sequence. It's really a very, very complicated soup of stuff. So I'll say more about that next time. I do have a couple of songs. They're both relatively short that I hope you will enjoy. The first of these is called the Codon Song. And it's to the tune of an old Beatles song called When I'm 64. Building of proteins, you ought to know, needs amino A's. Peptide bond catalysis in ribosomes. Triplet bases, three-letter codes. Mixing and matching nucleotides. Who is keeping score? Here is the lowdown if you count codons. You'll get 64. Do, 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 do. Got to line up right. 16 sRNA. Shine down Garnocyte. We'll talk about that later. You can make peptides every size with a proper code. Start codons positioned in the P-site place. Initiator tRNAs. UGA stops and AUGs go. Who could ask for more? You know the lowdown. Count up the codons. There are 64. OK, and today we get a second one. It's called Transcription to the tune of Frosty the Snowman. Phosphodiesters are the bonds of RNA that support a ribopolymer made of GCU and A. The RNA polymerase binds to a Tata box and copies from the template strand along the way it walks. Initiation of transcription thus proceeds from the close to open complexing in the DNA it reads. The sigma factor gets released. Its work is over fast. Polymerase can then advance after this step has been passed. In elongation, the polymerizing spree moves along the way in fits and starts synthesizing 5 to 3. The RNA is floppy and it dangles from one end. Oh, that's a most important thing for you to comprehend. Then termination finishes the RNAs. Thanks to protein row or hairpin forms that release the polymerase. So this describes transcription steps in three-part harmonies. Here's hoping with this melody you can learn it all with ease. The end. All right.